Okay, perfect. So the floor is all yours, so you may proceed with your presentation now. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And good evening, everyone, and, and welcome. I want to thank you for your time today to talk about a topic that I've been lecturing on since 2009. Uh, I'd like to share with you the five steps to building a high-performing team. I call it BHPT. And the subtitle is strategies are one thing, but how do we communicate our key directions to our various stakeholders? Since I was given such a beautiful introduction, I will skip my bio. And let's talk about our agenda for today. There's three parts to our talk today. And I like for this to be a conversation. Feel free to ask questions at any time. So we're going to talk about, in part one, what is a high-performing team? And then I have a very quick exercise for everyone to do, which is an assessment. We're going to talk about the high-performance cycle. We're going to talk about the, the key ingredients of a high-performance communication cycle. Part two, we're going to talk about culture and leadership. Under that, we're going to talk, talk about the key aspects of culture, we're going to talk about leadership and emotional intelligence, and then we'll have a second exercise. Part three is where we dig in and we talk about getting started. What is the recipe? And then, of course, we'll have a third exercise. And then, uh, then we'll wrap it up with a summary. I hope that sounds good to everyone. And with that, uh, let's proceed. I'd like to start our talk today with a story. A story about Uber. Now, I'm sure many of us have used Uber around the world, and we find that most times it's a great experience. But lately, Uber has hit a few bumps in the road, forgive the pun. In the Wall Street Journal, there was a story about Uber interviews heavyweights for a key job handling Travis Kalanick because of the various different issues within their culture and how people are being treated, it's not a very friendly environment. Then in the New York Times on April 12th, they talked about Uber sees an executive exodus as it faces questions of workplace culture. So here we have this tremendous billion dollar enterprise, this unicorn that's experiencing some basic fundamental issues. In the Los Angeles Times on April 28th, there was a lawsuit accuses Uber of ripping off drivers, paying them smaller fares than what passengers pay. All of these things are internal and external items that are going to hurt Uber. Now, if I'm an executive at Lyft, I am really going to press hard to try to get customers to understand that our culture is friendly to our employees, that our culture is friendly to our passengers, and, and that we are a very good alternative to Uber. And what we're going to talk about today are what are some of the fundamental items in the thread of our everyday activities. You know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, where do you see yourself being your ideal self? And I like to talk about the vision of the future for you to really look in the mirror and be honest with yourself and ask yourself, what is the vision of the future for my company or for my department or for my team or for my home? Where can I be better and do better? And, 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 and think about how exciting it would be to get some of those nagging issues off the plate that have been troubling you and holding your business back for some time. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. There was a survey, not too, not too long ago, 2015, that was done by uh, Cross Knowledge, which is a brand of Wiley Publishers. Wiley is a huge international uh, publisher in business as well as in scholarly publishing. And they did this survey and it's, and it talks about workforce development and business outcomes. 
And based on the research by the Economist Intelligence Unit, in which 295 international sea levels were asked about their relationship between workforce development and business outcomes. This is a very, very compelling stat. 88% of the survey C-suite executives, they see that workforce development as a priority and not an option. And when we talk about workforce development, we're talking about talent development. You know, we're talking about talent development um, as it relates to uh, administration, uh, technical, using your systems, but also those important human soft skills. And they believe it constitutes one of the three major arguments to attract top talents. And so when we think about building a high performance team, BHPT exclamation point, we, it's about investment in learning and development, 35%. The other factor is competitive pay, 45%. And then with today's knowledge workers, it talks about workplace flexibility, which is at 28%. So the employers are willing to invest in workforce development because what they want to achieve, they want to elevate the employment engagement at all levels. I wish we had more time today for me to talk about total quality management and Taguchi and how he worked with uh, the uh, general after World War II to rebuild Japan and how he came up with this total quality management. But it's about how do you engage employees so that everyone knows their role in the critical path of your customer. The second key point is boost responsiveness to new opportunities in the marketplace. Your team members are on the front line with your customers. They're hearing the good, the bad, and, and the ugly every day. And that information has to be put into a corpus where you can see what are the common threads of, 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 of where we're doing well, where we could do better, and maybe what we're not doing that we should be doing. So you want to make sure that your team members are able to communicate to everyone. And of course, it's all about how do you increase productivity? How do you make the work environment where folks are delighted to work? They're happy to come to work. They're happy to make suggestions because they know that those suggestions are going to be listened to. However, there are two main obstacles to deploy these strategies. And what are these two main obstacles? Well, one of those are technical obstacles, technological obstacles. Um, if you don't have some type of CRM system, you're missing out on an opportunity to collect information, to aggregate information. And budget obstacles. Too often times, we see training, team development, or or, or, or CRM systems as cost. I like for you to think of them as investment. At Seton Hall University, Professor Amar was on my program a few years ago, and he talked about an article he wrote in the Harvard Business Review, which focused on knowledge workers. And in his view, the accounting term of treating employees and team members as, a, as an accounting cost is the wrong way to look at that and to look at them as an investment. So when you think about, you know, what are the new strategies that C-suite is thinking about to, to develop their team, they're talking about mentoring. And mentoring comes down to hand-to-hand, -hand, day to day, giving employees feedback, which is which is which is very important. Online learning, allowing them to have the capability to truly understand the company's policies and procedures, uh, to understand why the company uh, has a particular process and procedure so that they can explain it to the customer. And then if the customer tells us that it doesn't make sense for us to bring this feedback back in and to refine our process and procedure, procedures. Social learning is very important. 
MOOCs. And MOOC stands for Massive Online Open Courses. And there's Khan Academy, uh, there's Coursera. And these are ways that you can motivate your team, your team members, to be involved in learning and be very excited about it. And, and it's very, also very cost effective. So let's do our first exercise. I'd like for you to, to answer these questions, yes or no. First question, we have a mission statement and it has been communicated to the team. Everyone knows it. Number two, we have outlined our strategy and it has been communicated effectively internally and externally. Number three, we have job descriptions that are tied to our mission and strategy. Number four, we have an annual performance objective setting program. Number five, we have an operations manual that addresses our business policies. And this operations manual is online and you can search it. And we have an FAQ. We have communication strategy and plan to keep our team members up to date on our business. And we're gonna talk about our communication strategy. We have a training program for our team members to talk a training program that covers not only the, the, the product and service area, but to talk about how we administer administration to our customers. And third are the soft skills, the human, the emotional intelligence skills that are necessary. Now it would be helpful to know um, if you if you answered all seven questions you are you are you have a high you, you should have a high performing organization if you've answered six questions you're very you're 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 also a high performing organization but there's room to to grow if you answered five questions yeah you're 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 okay but you're not great if you answer four questions well there's a lot of work to do. If you've answered yes to three or less questions, then there's a lot of work to do, but guess what? That means there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of growth for your company. So let's talk about the high performance cycle. You know, it's so important that everyone in the company understands the goals of the company. That means that they really need to understand the mission, the objectives, the strategy, and the tactics, and where they fit into this critical path of your customer. I always like to talk about the critical path of the customer, and somewhere where the critical path, the value chain of, of your customer's process is not clear, it will either delay or stop a customer from purchasing your, your, your product or service. And it creates frustration for your team members. So number one is goals, setting the goals and communicating those goals effectively. Number two within your organization is defining the roles and responsibility so that everyone understands what their role is, who they're gonna to have to interact with, and who does what. So that if a customer calls and there's an issue, that the person doesn't have to say, oh, Mr. Customer, let me put you on hold or let us get back to you because, again, that is delaying the, the, the customer's critical path to purchasing your, your goods or your service. If the person on the phone or on the, on the, bat, on the, chat, or the chat room or the bot chat room um, or the email, uh, or, or the social media feed that, that you have uh, is aware of how to answer that question correctly, it will speed up the process for that customer, thus speeding up the process for the customer to buy your good or service. Number three, define the processes. 
Everyone needs to understand the critical path of every process. They need to understand where they come on the stage and where they, where they exit the stage. And I like to look at this as a business as live theater. Because when we go to the theater to watch a live Broadway musical or play, the actors know when it's their turn to come on stage and deliver their line or to perform their scene. Business is no different, but we need to define it a lot better. We need to put what I like to call proverbial stakes in the ground that will allow everyone to know where their place is on the stage. And I call it the stage of business. Define resources. If we want people to be able to perform their duties as effectively as possible, let's make sure that we not only provide them the tools, but we provide them with the training for those tools. Assess and refine. Business is a very fluid process. And yes, while some activities uh, will remain consistently the same, However, as our environment change, as the needs of our customers change, it is so important that we're always assessing and refining. You know, my colleague, John Hoffman, we teach together at Seton Hall University, professional selling uh, at the Stillman School of Business, the MBA students. And we also train uh, companies globally. And one of the key things that my colleague, John, always says, to everyone, if you want to be the best that you can be, it is so important for you to understand what are the best practices for success. We think that there's three key rules that you need to follow. The first rule is that you have to learn what is the best practice for whatever activity that you're doing. Then rule number two, practice the best practice. Number three, Get feedback. Get feedback from a trusted colleague who's going to give you clear, great feedback. They're going to give you what we call the SWOT analysis of, of your presentation. So now that we've talked about the high performance cycle, which talks about setting the goals, number two, defining roles and responsibilities, number three, define the processes, number four, define the resources, Number five, assess and refine. Let's talk about the communication cycle. The communication cycle is when you're going to communicate internally and externally, first you want to communicate internally and you want to prepare your message and get feedback uh, from your, 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 your key stakeholders. Then you want to test it with the entire organization first, your internal organization. Once they've given you uh, uh, you test it and you communicate it to them, and then you listen for feedback. And then, of course, you adjust, you reply. So again, again the communication cycle is prepare the message. Number two, you, you test the message with some key colleagues, then you communicate it to the, uh, all the stakeholders. And you listen to them and you get their reply. And then you take that from what you've learned from listening to them, you build it into your reply. And then you go through that cycle again. You go through the cycle a couple of times. Before you go out to the marketplace, you will have a clear message to communicate. No one will be able to say, oh, I wasn't involved in the process. Oh, they should have asked me. I would have told them they needed to say it this way. So that is the communication cycle. So let's talk about culture. Culture. Culture, I like to say, sometimes if you're not working towards establishing the key principles of your, your, your culture, it becomes, if you don't do that, it becomes an open mic for those who, for whatever reason, they may have a problem with their immediate manager. It may, it may have been someone who 
uh, uh, you haven't paid attention to and they had a good idea. So you want to make sure that you are working towards establishing the principles of what your, your culture wants to be. One of my, my clients, I, I, I love uh, their particular uh, look, outlook on culture that they have established, Gadget Software in Newark, New Jersey. They are a mobile uh, publishing platform. Uh, every other Friday, uh, everyone is allowed to work from home. But when they're in the office on a Friday, uh, it's happy hour. And happy hour starts at 12 noon, and, and they bring in lunch. Uh, but what's interesting is that I've been there a few times, and uh, there's a lot of folks that are still there after 5 o'clock uh, working because they want to. They, they love what they're doing. The other thing that they have done that works for them is that they have a very flat organization, and people are empowered to, to take on various different tasks, and they allow them the room to be that knowledge worker uh, to, to develop whatever part of the platform that they're working on. So it's very important that as you, as you build your company or you want to refine the culture in your company, that you, you, know, you meet with your team members and talk about what would be a great culture for us to have to, to build the success that we want. So I always like to show this, this uh, particular slide from Mr. John P. Cotter. Uh, he's a renowned uh, writer in, in culture. And he talks about the four factors that shape managerial behavior. And managerial behavior is very important because uh, the team will follow whatever the leader is doing. So you got to look at what is your corporate culture? Um, corporate culture involves many different things, how people communicate, how they dress, uh, what is the policy for being on work on time, what is the, you know, uh, what, what is the policy for getting work done, uh, projects, uh, how are people uh, communicating with each other. So corporate culture is number one. And then, of course, what type of structure do you have? Uh, what type of, you know, even if your structure is informal, it, it's still a structure. And, and you want to make sure that the formal structure represents the principles of the type of business that you want to have. And what are the systems, the plans, and the policies that are available to your team for them to utilize to do their job? And then leadership. You know, you want to make sure that you have the right efforts that's going to articulate and implement the business vision and strategy. And it's not, okay, every year we, we gather in the, the, the kitchen and, and we, we talk about strategy. Uh, or vision. Um, those are things that need to be communicated from the top down, but everyone needs to be on board with those particular uh, strategies and vision. And what about the competitive and regulatory environment? What type of support or information does the company provide to the team that keeps them aware of what's happening in the field with your competition and what's happening in, in, in the field as it relates to the regulatory environment, the, whether it's uh, local, state, federal, or international. All of these four factors really will shape the behavior of a firm's management and therefore the behavior of your, of your team members. So I really want you to give thought to the type of culture that you want to have in your organization. So emotional intelligence. Um, I, I trust that you, you've heard about emotional intelligence, and we're going to talk about why it is important, you know, how to assess the EI of the emotional intelligence of you and your team, and how different is emotional intelligence than conflict management. And what are some of the best practices? This is, this is a particular seminar that we do as well, where we walk folks through understanding how to work uh, with people with, with, with different uh, drivers. So real quickly, you know, I got this from Wikipedia. I think it's a nice, uh, I think it's a nice definition. Emotional intelligence describes the ability, capacity, skill, or in the case of the trait 
of the EI model, a self-perceived ability to identify, assess, and manage the emotions of oneself, of others, and of groups. And it's so important that it's really taking the temperature, but also understanding and, and helping them to understand that, that you really understand, you're empathetic to their point, but also to a point where you can give them constructive feedback as to how to address whatever the situation might be. Some years ago, uh, in the 60s, my, I was in the fifth grade, my sister gave me a book called I'm Okay, You Okay. And it's a great book because it talks about how people take on different roles. They take on the role uh, in a discussion, whether it's the parent, the adult, or the child, and how one should deal with each level. Now, of course, when someone takes on the role of the child, there's something in their personality that, that, that makes them feel vulnerable. So as a manager, to be able to understand they're acting as a child, and not to tell them they're acting like a child, but to be able to get them to look at the professional aspects and bring them up to the professional level. Or sometimes you have someone who is acting like the adult, the authoritarian. And it is so important that you motivate people to do the right thing versus trying to make them to do something. And that's where, you know, it, it's so important that, um, uh, excuse me, as the adult that you're able, when someone acts like the parent, where they take on that authoritative role, but as the adult, you're able to balance them to get them to understand that it's easier to help someone to do something because they're motivated to do it versus making them to do it. We could talk, We really, there could be a whole webinar, a day session on emotional intelligence, but I just wanted to touch on that. And then I thought, I love sharing this from the U.S. Army. Uh, it talks about what are some of the key principles of leadership. And it's all about knowing yourself and always seeking improvement. Always saying that you don't know everything, but you're seeking to learn. And also being the go-to person that's technically proficient in seeking responsibility and take responsibility for your actions. Recently, we saw how United Airlines didn't, didn't follow these principles and it has hurt them in the stock market, it has hurt their reputation, and of course it has hurt them financially. Set the example. Know your people, look out for their well-being. Keep your workers informed. Develop a sense of responsibility in your workers. Ensure that tasks are understood, supervised, and accomplished. Train as a team. Use the full capabilities of your organization. These are 11 key principles that if you strive to work towards these principles, you will find areas that where you're, you have strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we'll talk about that later on in this presentation. So when we look at leadership, this is just one model of many model. And the beautiful thing about building a high performing team, what I should have said at the outset is that this isn't the only way to build a high performing team, but this is a recipe that I have learned over the years. I learned it from Xerox. We find it at Dow Jones Financial News Services and fully, fully utilized it as the Managing Director of the Americas for Elsevier during my 11 year tenure. So when you think about leadership, you have the concern for people and also the concern for production. And you wanna find that balance. You wanna find that balance where everyone is, 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 is being responsible, everyone is cooperating, collaborating, communicating. And so you want to be hopefully, you know, around the around the, 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 the seven, eight on, on each of the axes. And that's something for you to discuss with your team to talk about how do we get there? What are the things that are holding us back? So, you know, when you think about the high performing team characteristics, and I apologize for the small print but I wanted to get all this in here. It starts with 
participative leadership. You want to make sure that everyone is aligned on the purpose. Make sure everything is task focused. Everyone is sharing responsibility. That you're allowing folks to be innovative. And that you're actively seeking to solve problems. Actively seeking to say, what can we do better? And being very communicative. Communicating, communicating, communicating. Last but not least, being responsive to your colleagues. So now we're gonna jump into the recipe for building a high performing team. Of course, we, we, we start with the mission. What is our strategy, objective, tactics? The POA, the plan of action. Everything has to have a plan of action. Everyone needs to understand the org chart, job descriptions, you know, who reports to who, who's doing what. You want to make sure that the performance objective setting and review period, it matches with, the, with your strategy objectives and tactics. And we want to make sure that the compensation is tied into that as well. Your operations manual, I said manual sounds print, but you want to make sure that it's online. You got an FAQ that people can find information and that you're doing CBT computer-based training to make sure that they're up on all of your policies and that's where the training and communication are so 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 important so when we look at the five steps of building a high performing team step one is that assessment review step two is the SWOT and gap analysis Step three, design of your strategic plan of action. Step four, your implementation of your strategic plan of action. Step five, you always have to measure. Performance dashboard, your measurement of your strategic plan of action. So, you know, when we think about the step one, the assessment, you know, we had that little, little test earlier, you know, what are the best practices of your peers and in other industry organizations? What is the gap analysis of your current communication strategy? What tools do you use to communicate with your team or your targeted audience? How do you measure success? If you look in the mirror and ask yourself the, the, these following questions and you say, you know what, we really don't do that or we could do that better, then there's opportunity to really not only grow your business, but build a very high performing organization. You know, it's interesting, uh, Google has, has, has started back in the late 90s and they haven't missed a beat. Now Uber started off like gangbusters, but, but there's issues now. Can they correct them? Absolutely. So step two is to Look at your, do your SWOT analysis, your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So we could spend, you know, a, a, a good part of the day talking about, you know, you know, strengths and weaknesses. Strengths and weaknesses refer to looking internally at you, at your organization. The opportunities and threats is an external view of looking at what's happening in your environment that where there are opportunities, and what are the threats? Threats could be a new competitor. Threat can be government regulations. Threat could be that maybe you're, you haven't moved to the cloud yet and your competitors have moved to the cloud. So you really need to, uh, to do it. And based upon that, you're able to do a gap analysis. And the gap analysis is, is quite frankly, is looking at your current state and looking at your, the best practices of your competitors or who's number one. If you're not number one, who's number one and, and, and understanding what they're doing and look at your desired state. But then from there comes the action plan. And the action plan is the devil in the details. It's where um, you write out, you know, here's our design for our strategic plan of action. Here are all the things that we need to give thought to, that we need to do. 
you need to outline them very, very clearly. You know, what I call the five W's and H, you know, the who, what, when, where, why, and then how are you going to do it? That is just so, so, so important. So when you, when you think about that, you got to think about what is it that we want to do? Why is it important that we, 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 we do that? Who is going to do it? When are we going to get it done? And where are we going to do it? And then, of course, the how. Very, very, very important. I could, I mean, this is a lecture, a, another lecture for another day, um, because we're throwing in a number of key strategic concepts. And then, of course, the Gantt chart. You want to make sure that your Gantt chart is clear. Everyone is involved. Everyone knows their role. Um, there's many different ways to do a Gantt chart. Find what fits best for you in your organization. And of course, it covers you know, what's going to be done, who's going to do it, and what time frame. Last but not least, it's the performance dashboard in regards to how are you measuring success. If you can't measure it, you want to have SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, responsible, and timely. <clears throat> so you want to make sure that you have those. So when you look at the strategic focus of the company, your mission statement, we've talked about this. Do you have one? Why it's important? Uh, if you don't have a map to where you want to go, your aspiration, um, you're just going to be floating out in the sea. Um, you want to establish what the objectives are, what's the strategy, and then, of course, the tactics. Then we look at continuing on a successful foundation from a macro view. We just talked about the mission, objective, strategy, and tactics. And then looking at the direction, job descriptions, objective setting, performance reviews, compensation. And then looking at your human capital, the interviewing and onboarding process, the communication and training program, policies and procedures, and most important, fairness and consistency. So when you think about the onboarding process, it's all about recruiting knowing who you want to recruit, what are the key skill sets, and what type of culture you want to have, and how does this person represent the person who can participate in this culture. Interviewing, making sure you and your team clearly have interviewing guidelines, which allows personal flexibility. But again, the overarching theme is that everyone's on the same page in regard to how you consider candidates. And then, of course, the selection process selecting people based upon the key principles that you have established for your business. Training, making sure your people are truly empowered. Um, I just recently talked to an industry colleague in the scholarly publishing industry, and her company, the American Chemical Society, has a nine-month program where they have 20 candidates come together for two days every month to work on a particular aspect of their development, and then they have graduation. And then assessment. Assessment always needs to be uh, very clear, very fair, and, 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 and very objective. So as we're wrapping up here, again, the recipe for building a high-performing team, you want to make sure you have your mission, your strategy objectives, your plan of action, your org chart and job descriptions, performance objective setting, and review your operations manual, and last but not least, training. And this is a continuous cycle. That's why the arrows, it's, it's an ever-evolving circle of information. So do your assessment, and do your assessment with your team. Share it with them so that, so that they'll know that they're involved in the very beginning. Step two, identify your SWOT and gap analysis. This is just a very simple, uh, grid I put together, but you can design it to meet the, you know, your needs. Design of the strategic plan. Again, you know, build it so that it reflects your environment, the item that needs to be done, the objective of the item, the key tasks to address them, and then the who, what, when, where, why, and how, and the time to achieve the completion of the task. And, and certainly do not forget about the resources to do it as well. Step four, the implementation plan. Make it fun. 
um, have people involved. Everyone, every, maybe there are teams with, with different team names or, or team colors, whatever is appropriate in your culture. And then, of course, the performance dashboard, making sure that everyone knows what the, the dashboard is for every group in every department. So getting started, next steps. What is your starting point? Be honest with yourself. Do your assessment of your company, the SWOT analysis. Develop your company's mission if you don't have one. Look at the organization objective and strategic plan of action. Making sure that you've looked at your job descriptions, you've updated them, the objective setting, performance reviews and training. Making sure that you have a communication strategy that is consistent and persistent with your internal customers, which is your team players, and making sure you have a performance dashboard. So let me say that I've enjoyed our time today. I just want you to establish a sound foundation of information for your team, establish a strategic direction with the right policies and procedures and training program. Consistency, commitment, and conviction are just so important. You wanna manage, monitor, and you wanna motivate them. Most of all, have fun being profitable. I want to thank you for your time this morning, and I look forward to your questions. And I just have a few resources. I mean, there's many books out there, but these are just a few that I think uh, will be of great interest to you. If there are questions, I'm so happy to address your questions. Well, thank you very much, Daryl. Folks, we are now open for a question and answer. So if you have any questions, you can always put it in the question box chat box or you could equally raise your hand there's a hand icon available on the console so please click on it if you want to speak directly with the speaker so let me go to the first question in the box already there are a few why is it important for the leader to be consistent in their daily professional behavior yeah it's a very good question thank you for that um <clears throat> consistency is so important because your team members are gonna follow the behavior of the leader. And if the leader demonstrates that they're not consistent, that starts to break down trust in the environment. It starts to break down trust um, in the office. And you'll start to see that people will start to chatter that, <clears throat> so let's just say if the leader's name is Bob, and Bob had taken a decision to not provide a particular customer credit, and there was a another situation, same situation, same principles, but Bob gave that other customer a credit. It was so important for him to explain his reasoning why, just because there might be a nuance that might not be publicly known. But if Bob doesn't educate his people about why he had that change of decision for this other customer, <clears throat> they're, they're, they're not going to start, to, they're really going to start to question Bob's judgment. And the worst thing that can happen to a leader is for people to tr uh, not trust their judgment, but also to, to begin to not trust them. Thank you very much. Uh, another one. How does a leader establish a productive culture? You know, I, I think it, it all starts with the leader um, not only having a plan, but before he implements, he or she implements the plan to get feedback from some trusted advisors. Leadership is very similar to um, acupuncture. The whole purpose of acupuncture is to get proper blood flow through the body. Well, your organization is no different. And so the leader wants to make sure that he's, that, that he's getting feedback from the various folks within the, the different leaders at the different levels and, and then communicate to them that based upon the feedback that he's gotten from some very trusted folks throughout the organization, that this is going to be the, the way that the leader is going, the company is going to move forward. But also, you know, town hall meetings are very important to say, for the leader to say, you know, I've been thinking about this particular situation and here's one thought that I have as to how we can address it. What do you guys think about this, this, res, this, this solution? And to listen to the feedback. And with that feedback, for the leader to say, I don't have all the answers. The answers 
lie within the organization. And when, when people start to see that the leader is taking feedback and then including them, their, their feedback into their decisions, that builds a culture of trust. Thank you very much. You have another one from Mr. Mr. Nadim Hashmi. How leader manage his team if team is overqualified and not ready to sync? So if I understand correct the question correctly, he says, is it that if the lead is the leader overqualified? Overqualified and not ready to sync with the team. Not ready to sync with the team. Well, I tell you. Um, the way that I interpret not ready to sync with the team, that means that the leader really needs to understand uh, their, their, their personal SWOT analysis because a leader always needs to, to be able to sync with the team. And so if the leader is short on some social skills or dealing with different personalities, then I would recommend that the leader to get a coach. Um, Executive coaching is one of the things that we do at Country Media Group, and we help leaders to understand what we call uh, their personal SWOT analysis and also their Johari window. Uh, Johari window is a psychology term uh, that I learned way back in, when I was at Seton Hall taking psychology, where it's a side that you don't see that the public sees. So the leader really needs to self-identify with their strengths and weaknesses and look to see where their opportunities and threats are and, and, and to work on that. And there's many tools that are available uh, for folks to utilize. One is the 360 feedback, where you get feedback from uh, your, your, your manager, you get feedback from your peers, and you get feedback from people who report into you. And it's, it's very important for a leader to look in the mirror and be honest with themselves. Because when you're able to do that, you're able to grow and grow beyond whatever insecurities that you might have. I mean, keep in mind that we're all human beings and we all have uh, that, that biggest room in all of our lives is the room for improvement. And so I would suggest to that leader is to start today, start today and to map out a strategy because working with team, different types of team members, it's all about giving yourself the right tools to deal with various different types of issues, problems, people, et cetera. And when you have the tools, at least it gives you a mechanism for you to understand. And one of the key things that a, the best thing that a leader can do is the ability to listen and understand what are the issues facing the team. Uh, and just a supplementary question uh, from Mr. Hashmi, the opposite. If team is not willing to sync with leader, each one having their own cat on the mat, how about it? Okay. Um, there's something called skill versus will. And when each team member, and see, it's so important that everyone buys into the overarching strategy. If everyone understands the company's vision, the company's uh, mission, and strategy objectives and the role that 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 uh, they are responsible for. Then it comes down to: Do they have the skill to do the task within their domain, and do they have the will to do it? Now, over the course of my career, I've managed thousands of people. Um, I've had a, I built a team at Elsevier of 130 people. When I first started. I started with a very small organization because it was a new organization for the Americas. And one of the folks that I inherited had interviewed for, for, for the role, the managing director role, but, but, but did not get it. And she said to me that um, uh, she didn't want to travel. So I said to her, obviously you have the skill, but there seems to be a will problem. And keep in mind that before I joined Elsevier, uh, you accepted this role, this particular position with these duties that require travel. I said, now, if you don't want to fulfill your commitment, then I don't have a place for you. If you do want to fulfill that commitment, you're more than welcome to fulfill this role. And let me tell you, that conversation, she, she turned it around and she actually did very well. And uh, we got along very nice. And we, 
and it's been years since I've managed our organization, but we stay in touch today. So for the manager who just said that the person doesn't want to do the job, then that requires uh, some one-on-one -on -one feedback on the skill versus the will. And if someone doesn't want to do it, they need to understand what the consequences of their decision. I have always said, I do not fire anyone. People fire themselves because they choose not to do their job or they do something that is unethical and we have to part ways with them. Thank you very much. You have another one from Mr. Abbas Combord. The question is, what would you recommend a leader to do in incentivizing an underperforming team to derive improved performance? Uh, I love that question. And this is something I firmly believe in. Um, in the book, The Art of War, uh, Sun Tzu talks about when you take over a village, everyone within the army at every level, based upon their rank, is provided uh, some incentive. And I firmly believe that. And I think that the incentive plan needs to be a plan that provides for everyone and is very fair. And I think I like to use the words customary and reasonable in regards to compensation. And when they look outside to other organizations and they see that your organization is going the extra mile, uh, they're going to know they're in a very good environment. I had the opportunity of watching uh, Bloomberg grow uh, from one terminal to being the world's leader. And Michael Bloomberg, way back when, in his New York office, he would offer his, his team, everyone, uh, breakfast and lunch. And this was in the 80s. So he was way ahead of the, the, the so-called internet folks. Uh, with that. So you want to make sure that you have a program that fits within your budget, but also you have to be mindful of your budget and you want to make sure that uh, this is a benefit that you can provide them that you don't have to take away. But I truly believe in making sure that your incentive programs are aligned and communicated very well and for folks to understand the significance of, of what your organization is doing for them. Well, thank you very much, and that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. Daryl, any quick remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? Concluding remarks. Yes, um, I, I, I would like to say that building a high-performing team, um, it's an everyday exercise. And don't, it's a marathon. It is not a sprint. And set realistic goals and start in baby steps. Start with baby steps, but you always want to uh, set a performance dashboard and, and, and then after you achieve those goals, set higher goals. And of course, here at Country Media Group, we're here to assist anyone in any of those endeavors. And I want to thank you and everyone. I want to thank the, the Mom Medina Institute for this opportunity to present this topic that I love so much. Thank you very much. And folks, that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. I really want to thank you, Professor uh, Daryl Gunter, for your valuable time for delivering this live webinar through Miles platform. So thank you very much. And thank you, everyone who participated in this webinar. We are recording it. Please stay tuned to webinar.mile.org to learn about our upcoming programs, webinars, or to access our recording versions. With that note, I would like to end and conclude. So you all have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much.